Okay guys, I'm back again. Um, this time starting off our topics for our spring semester. So, one of the first topics that we talk about is the West, which honestly, this is a freaking cool time period. There's a lot of stuff going on and uh, just a disclaimer guys, the, these time periods we're going to talk about in the spring semester. Starting off, okay, we already introduced one of them, which is Reconstruction. That happens at the same time as this topic, the West. So we're going to get very regional based history um, from this time period from like 1865 to roughly about the beginning of World War I. So just bear that in mind. What the West experiences is kind of completely different than what the South experiences or states, you know, in the North. So we're going to even like delve into like foreign policy at this time. So this is really when America starts to become its own like badass country <laughs> and uh, really starts to show its might around the world. So um, let's go ahead and sit back and figure out what the hell happens in the West because this was transformative to various people in the West. Um, and in particular with Native Americans, this was very detrimental. So, here we go. This is the West. And in order to put ourselves in the right mind frame for understanding the West, we need to understand Frederick Jackson Turner. So, here's what we got going on. He's a historian. And, um... Like all us history nerds, we write about history. Okay, this is what we freaking do. So, he comes up with what is known as the Frontier Thesis. Um, and what he writes in, you know, this book that's going to be entitled The Frontier in American History. He basically looks at the 1890 census and he sees that the United States essentially has no more land to conquer. We've already stretched from sea to shining sea. We've already established our current boundaries that we have with Canada and with Mexico. So honestly, there's no real uncharted territory to go out west. And this kind of freaks him out. Well, maybe not him, but like people who, who hear him talk about this. It freaks him out because he's displaying this, I think, at the Chicago World Fair at the time. So, why this freaks people out is because the frontier has been our American identity, pretty much. The further we expand out west, the more influence we have over, you know, the land and the cultures. And arguably, people living out west are more rugged, they're more individualistic. And they embody more of the American spirit. At least like the whole like, you know, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps kind of thing. So, with the West being no more, because the 1890 census shows us that we have more than enough people to settle like pretty much every freaking square mile of this place. We, therefore, don't really have a means of expanding our influence. So we'll come back to Frederick Jackson Turner when we talk about imperialism because it definitely goes hand in hand. You can make the argument that conquering the West was basically our precursor to imperialism or rather an extension to it. So yeah, the West is going to be a very diverse place. There are lots of different people out west, and American culture will continue to grow. Of course, you know, after we've closed up the frontier in 1890, we'll continue to grow with imperialism and spreading our influence around the world. But um, let's go ahead and jump into what makes the West the West. and. One of the first things that we think about when we come to the West is the California Gold Rush. Alright, this was the big movement out West in the 1840s. Um, we find gold at Sutter's Mill, 
1848 and then everybody freaking like goes all right they're like all right we found some gold we're gonna mine the hell out of it so it's not to say that there weren't people out west already i mean let's face it okay the spanish were out here um we also had you know once mexico won its independence okay mexican people were living along the southwest um, people had already started traveling out west via the Oregon Trail at this time, and tragedy already struck at um, <laughs> uh, the Donner Pass. Yeah, ask me about that one later. Cannibalism in American history. So, that's, dude, we do some crazy crap in American history, and that's one of them. Um, but anyways, sidetracking here. Really the gold rush is the thing that is going to really bring about a lot of people out west to california it's yeah california is a place to be out west so um yeah john sutter tries to like keep all this info to himself because he's the one who really like finds this stuff but yeah the word travels fast so because we have so many people going out west Places like Cal uh, San Francisco, California are going to boom overnight. We're talking, you know, by 1860, already 60,000 residents, making it one of the largest cities in the country. So, um, yeah, gold is going to attract a lot of people out west. Um, and you do have a lot of people coming from foreign countries. Okay, here we've got... Uh, people from Chile, people from China. I mean, the Chinese are going to come over in droves to try to strike their fortune with the gold rush, but they are often met with hostility and, well, nativism because, yeah, nativism is going alive and well in this country at that time. Our hatred of immigrants is strong. So, um, just like we had talked about out east with like the know-nothing party and how they hated on like the Irish and the German immigrants here out west they're hating on the Chinese all right so they're gonna be subject to like just scrutiny and just discrimination I mean having them pay a special foreigners minor tax plus you know threats of violence and just other harassment by nativists so um for native americans though like the gold rush is kind of disastrous because it gets people encroaching on their land i mean really now the people know that gold is out in california they're also suspect suspecting that gold and like silver and other like precious metals and stuff are going to be throughout the, the west okay so um this gets problematic as we discover more and more um nevada is the comstock load which you know do we find a whole a whole lot of silver in these mines um so this is around 1859 so between the years of 1859 and 1878 i mean freaking like rolling in the silver like really just there's a lot of silver being found so the silver rush is going to jumpstart places like nevada virginia city is a large city at that time that springs up overnight um again because of the mining opportunities in the area so um we're going to talk more about these boom towns in a minute and their makeup, but you know, boom towns, I mean, are surrounding the mines. That's exactly what they are. So we're going to find like other gold and silver rushes throughout the West, places like Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, South Dakota in the Black Hills, Colorado, and yeah, Alaska. <laughs> We'll talk about Alaska more when we get to imperialism, but just know there's some gold out there, and um, it's not a frozen wasteland. So, speaking of these boom towns, alright, this is what we got. Now, 
boom towns are going to follow the mining communities and um, be established around these areas. So one of the most famous boom towns out west is Deadwood, South Dakota. We are talking like everything you guys think of when we think of like western movies and TV shows and such. Deadwood is essentially setting the standard. So um, instead of cowboys here, you more so see miners. All right, that's the difference because, okay, we're going to have two types of towns out west. Boom towns with the mines, cattle towns following the cattle trails. So there's your distinction. Um, but essentially both types of towns will be the same. We're going to have general stores supplying your everyday goods. We're going to have hotels because, let's face it, a bunch of single dudes out west mining need a place to stay. And of course, subsequently, um, boarding houses for those people passing through. Saloons will be a mainstay because, let's face it, you strike your rich, you want to drink. Like, no joke. I mean, it's a, remember, a bunch of single guys. They're going to spend their money on booze and women. Which brings us to the brothels. <laughs> really, guys. <laughs> um, yeah, the brothels will be upstairs above the saloons because, let's face it, brothels know their clientele. And they know that when they're drunk, they'll be more than likely to spend their money. So, um, yeah, <laughs> we see that very often. But a unique thing, though, okay, about brothels, but, all right, besides the obvious, like, happenings of the brothels, okay? The interesting thing about brothels out west is that they're ran by women. So here's the thing about the west. Women have the most freedom out west and the most like political influence and power, the most economic power out west because the west is so unique with how it treats certain individuals. Yeah, I mean, okay. Minorities are treated bad, all right? Yeah, we're establishing that already. But everybody who's not a minority, okay, basically if you're white, um, a white woman is treated with respect. And we're not talking about, oh, the chivalrous like kind of crap where it's like, oh yeah, you're a lady. No. We're talking about, they are freaking respected almost as equals. And this is because of the economic might that women have out West. Like I was talking about with the brothels, women own these places. They own the boarding houses. They own the hotels. They own the brothels. They have money out West. like. They're some of the richest people in town kind of money. So, of course, these women are going to use that to their advantage. Because let's face it, money talks in politics. So, subsequently, the West is going to give women the right to vote way before any other area of the country. East Coast doesn't get it to, like, the 19th Amendment, basically. But out West, especially in places like Wyoming, Women are already voting since 1869. So, yeah, it takes the rest of the country about 50 years to catch up with Wyoming. And again, it's because women have economic power, which gives them political power, which gives them more rights. So, much respect to the, to the women out West. They, they knew how to work it. I mean, really, they got what they wanted. So, okay, more about these boom towns. All right, we are also going to see some lawlessness in these boom towns. So this is where we're talking like, you know, Robin of stagecoaches, because let's face it, stagecoaches like the Wells Fargo stagecoaches. Yeah, we're talking the bank. All right. <clears throat> They're going to be transporting, of course, like the gold and silver or so. You know, stagecoach robbers know this, and they're going to be like, all right, let's rob a stagecoach. Let's steal money. Okay, same thing with the trains out west. They're going to be transporting gold and silver. 
So there's train robberies as well. Bank robberies, because they know people are depositing gold and silver. So um, there's going to be a lot of lawlessness out west. And sometimes we have vigilante justice. So sometimes people like take it, take the law into their own hands and try to, you know, bring some order to the West. So because we have this void of actual law and order, proper law and order established, yeah, people take, take justice into their own hands. And so we do have law and order eventually established out West. And so this is where we get the rise of like the sheriff out West, that kind of figure you know, who tries to tame just pretty much the savagery and the wildness of the West at that time. And um, so we're going to get some really freaking famous sheriffs out West, um, one of it, which will be Wyatt Earp, who is arguably one of the most famous sheriffs of the West. Another one will be Bat Masterson. And of course, here in Deadwood, South Dakota, it's going to be Wild Bill Hickok. So, um, that's not to say that women didn't also act like tough figures at the time, too. I mean, you freaking mess with Calamity Jane, you're getting your head shot off. <laughs> like, really? She is a sharpshooter <laughs> and um, a trick shooter, and she can, she can go with the best of them. Her, Annie Oakley, also stagecoach Mary. Um, who is an African-American woman who rides stagecoaches and you try to mess with her, she will mess you up. Like, no joke. The women out west are a force to be reckoned with. Like, 100%. So, uh, going back to this nativism talk of the west, people are discriminated against. It depends where and with what types of industries, but essentially, um, Mexicans are going to be discriminated along the border, okay, because, well, nativism, all right, the Chinese are discriminated against in well-mining towns, and especially in California, and even African Americans to an extent, because the West is also going to be filled with a lot of ex-Confederate soldiers, so there's still some of that prejudice like built in. But um, minorities will sometimes earn the respect of the people in the West based on merit. So um, just like how freaking tough they are, just like the instance that we talked about with Stagecoach Mary. She freaking earned respect <laughs> by being just really tough. So, um, yeah, it's going to happen in various, you know, aspects of the West. But for the Chinese, though, the Chinese really get it bad. There is a lot of anti-Chinese, like, sentiment out West. And, I mean, yeah, it's all, like, racism and nativism. That's exactly what it is. So, and the sheer fact that there are a lot of Chinese people coming over, yeah, people are just going to discriminate. There's going to be violence against Chinese miners and just, well, Chinese communities in general. We see a lot of that in California. Um, and it gets so bad that uh, government officials in places like California are going to lobby government to, well, exclude the Chinese from coming in. So this is where we get the Chinese Exclusion Act. All right, guys, if you ever blank on what this is, just use your context clues, guys. Like, seriously, Chinese exclusion. Who are they excluding? The Chinese. OK, so the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 is the byproduct of all of this racism and nativist sentiment towards the Chinese. And um, this law was in effect for a good 10 years. But um, we will still continue to see discrimination against the Chinese, even the ones here already. Um, and yeah, the Chinese do have a bad out west, like just, just saying, they do. 
Okay, a little bit about women. We kind of already touched on this, right? We already touched on women owning the boarding houses. They also own the laundries, restaurants as well, saloons, and well, brothels. <laughs> and like we said, you know, women are going to gain economic power, political power, and more freedoms out west as a result of their importance to the local economies. And yeah, women enjoy a lot more freedoms out west than in the rest of the country. So if you guys were to ask me, like, where would you go? It would depend on a couple things. It would depend on my social class. And um, yeah, honestly, that's what it would depend on. <laughs> So, if I was rich, I'd stay back east because the rich are freaking rolling in the money at this time. Um, but, if I was just middle class or like lower class, I would totally like take my chances out west. Seriously. I would have so much more freedom here. Like, it'd be a hella tough life, but freedom wise, hell yeah. I'd be voting before everybody else. Okay, so let's shift gears a little bit, guys. Let's talk about mining again. Because, yeah, mining is a big business out west. But we are going to do some really bad things to the environment. Because, you know, we do stuff like strip mining. We do stuff like hydraulic mining. We, we really tear up the environment out west because we are mining gold and silver and copper and what else precious metals that we have out there. So, um, some of these places out west are still going to be experiencing problems even today. Yeah, I mean, some places still have contaminated water, the wildlife and their habitat was just destroyed, the land was eroded, I mean, and there are places out west that have not recovered. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty bad. And once the mines have already been stripped, these boom towns that we talked about are going to become ghost towns. People are going to abandon these places. And, I mean, yeah, they were tied to the mines, so if you can't find any more gold and silver, I mean, there's no point in being there anymore. All right, another big industry that we're going to have out west is lumber. And this is more so in places like Wisconsin, Minnesota, like those areas, which we kind of consider Western. Um, also Washington, Oregon, and you know, the big forests in California. So yeah, these are considered Western. Um, and since the country is literally being rebuilt because of reconstruction down South, expansion out West, uh, the growth of cities in the North, and in the east, there's going to be a big, big demand for lumber. So that's why, you know, lumber is also another booming industry out west. Um, the next booming industry out west is honestly going to be the railroad. And so the precursor, though, to the railroad, um, as far as like transmitting communication and such, will be the Pony Express. Um, these guys were the fastest riders in the West, and um, you want a message like sent like really freaking fast, you go with these guys. So they're uh, established in St. Joseph, Missouri. They travel all the way to Sacramento, California. They're only in operation for about a year, but um, these guys were way faster than Stagecoach. And um, since the Transcontinental Railroad will be built pretty soon, uh, these guys will be made obsolete after that, but some of the badass people that we talked about so far, like Wild Bill Hickok, they're part of the Pony Express at first. But the railroad is going to be what really transforms the West because it does so many things. The Transcontinental Railroad, I mean, we talked about this prior to the Civil War. Plans are being drawn up. We're trying to figure out where it extends. You know, all of this, all of these logistics, but then the Civil War happened. So uh, the Union takes it upon themselves to go ahead and initiate the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad and rather take the lead for it. So um, 
we've got two competing railroad companies that are going to go ahead and construct the Transcontinental Railroad. We've got the Central Pacific based out of California and we've got the Union Pacific based out of, well, Missouri and this end of the country. So, um, they're supposed to meet right in the middle and they're getting paid handsomely because of the Pacific Railway Acts. These acts were passed well, during the Civil War, 1862 and 1864, there's two different ones, and they're going to allow the government to basically grant private lands to the railroad companies as compensation for them building the Transcontinental Railroad. So essentially these railroad companies will be getting 20 sections of public land, you know, for every mile of track that they lay. So, all right guys, here's the thing with big corporations at this time. This is the first time we've ever come across them. We have not dealt with big business before. And the biggest business in the country at that time is the railroads. It's the biggest industry we have. So, in business, <laughs> greed. A greed always, always strikes up especially now in this time period because, like I said guys, the experience out east, the experience out west, the experience in the south, completely different. So railroads kind of like bridge the gap between the experiences out east and in the west. Out east you have the corporate side of the railroads and those guys are really, really greedy. Like to the point where they would screw over their best friends just to get another buck. Like. And we're talking like ultimate greed here with big business during this time period. So what these railroad companies are going to do is um, curve the hell out of their track so that they could um, get more money. So instead of establishing like straight lines, you know, cutting distance, oh hell no. They're going to really curve the hell out of this railroad because they want that government land, because they know they can sell the government land and make a lot of money. So a good show to watch for this aspect of the West and the subsequent Gilded Age will be the show called Hell on Wheels. Like really, it has such a good show. It's on Netflix and this is what it talks about. It talks about the West, the Transcontinental Railroad, um, corporate greed, I mean, all of the above. So, um, <clears throat> the Pacific Railway Act gets the ball rolling. Of course, we gotta wait till after the Civil War to begin construction, but really, I mean, yeah, things are set in motion. So, why railroads are so important to us is because, of course, they're going to make traveling out west a lot easier, a lot cheaper, a lot faster. Just like the rivers and canal systems had done during, um, you know, our first industrial revolution and the market revolution, railroads are going to do the same thing for us on a larger scale, connecting the whole country during our second industrial revolution, during the Gilded Age and, well, our conquering of the West. So people are going to settle up West because of the Transcontinental Railroad, communication is going to improve because of the Transcontinental Railroad and Western farmers and Eastern manufacturers will find new markets for their goods because of the Transcontinental Railroad. When I'm saying the Transcontinental Railroad transforms this country, that's an understatement. <laughs> I mean, it completely changes this country. So that's why the railroad is so important to understand especially the effects of it. Now, there's going to be certain things created because of the railroad. I mean, we're going to have to like standardize like the railroad tracks because none of that was standardized before. <laughs> we had regional railroad lines before out east, um, but now we're thinking cross country. So we got to, you know, create some standards. And speaking of standards, time zones, because it was freaking crazy. <laughs> how confusing the train schedules were back then because we didn't have time zones. Like, if 
they said a train was going to get there at 11 o'clock. Uh, whose time? Because <laughs> seriously, I think at one point there was like at least 20 different time zones in the country. So this is the time period where we're going to establish our four standard time zones. You know, um, Eastern, Central, Mountain, and Pacific. Like, yeah, that's going to get done at this time. Another thing that's going to get done, switching from iron tracks to steel tracks. Because iron is brittle, it, you know, just gets bad over time. Steel, a lot stronger, a lot more durable, and um, it won't be built to last. So, uh, George Westinghouse is going to be one of these first inventors for the railroad. And um, believe it or not, guys, <laughs> around this time, the railroad had, like, no brakes. <laughs> to slow down the train. You had to do just that. You had to like time it and gradually slow down. Yeah, there was a lot of accidents. <laughs> a lot of freaking accidents out west until we get a couple of inventions like George Westinghouse's automatic air brake and um, we get like standard gauges and such. Um, so another thing important about like the transcontinental railroad is that communication is going to improve because alongside the railroad you guys see in this picture right here where those big poles those are telegraph poles so the telegraph lines will also extend where the railroad tracks are laid which further brings the country together via communication so yeah how this railroad is built is going to be on the backs of several different types of people. We've got um, ex-Confederate soldiers. All right, they're going to be working for the uh, Union Pacific, along with Irish immigrants, um, the freedmen coming from the South, so African American freedmen, Mexican Americans as they move further into Western lands, um, and like we said, ex-Confederate soldiers. So. These four groups are going to be working for the Union Pacific, which, remember, is starting in um, Omaha, Nebraska. Now, the Central Pacific, they're going to rely a lot on the Chinese to build this railroad. They do also have, like, Irish and, you know, and others, um, but the Chinese are the ones who really go through the mountains that the Central Pacific has to, like, blast through. They're being put in very dangerous situations like carrying nitroglycerin. Yeah, nitroglycerin is like super unstable and yeah, these guys got the job of like handling that stuff. So there's going to be a lot of accidents, a lot of deaths. We have also a lot of like cave-ins, avalanches that the Central Pacific and their Chinese workers will, you know, will experience. So yeah, railroad's no joke, man. <laughs> This is some hard freaking work, but in the end, it is worth it. In 1869, this is where the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific meet. They meet at Promontory Mountain in Utah. So, um, they are there. You see the both trains meeting, and that picture is snapped. Um, I think in the picture, it looks like Collis Huntington, who was in charge of the Central Pacific, and uh, Charles Durant, who is in charge of, um, well, no, Thomas Durant, not Charles Durant, Thomas Durant, who is in charge of the Union Pacific. So, yeah, this transcontinental railroad transforms the nation completely. We, um, again, link east and west. We link the whole country together. So, we can transport things a lot faster, a lot safer, a lot cheaper. People, products, goods, like everything. Communication flows because of this. And yeah, the Transcontinental Railroad, according to many historians, is a major factor in closing the Western frontier. And that's why by 1890, Frederick Jackson Turner is saying, yeah, we got no more frontier left. So that's kind of why? Because the West has now been settled thanks to the Transcontinental Railroad. So, because the West is rapidly being settled because of this railroad, of course what happens to Native Americans is going to be detrimental to them. 
the railroad companies are going to be taking so much land from the Native Americans, pushing them further and further into various corners of the West because they've encroached on their tribal lands. Now, there's going to be major clashes amongst the Plains Indians and, um, you know, the American government when it comes to, like, the Calvary that's stationed throughout the West. So, major clashes when it comes to that. Plus, amongst, like, the railroad companies and just people out West in general. I mean, Native Americans will be constantly clashing with these people because, let's face it, we're getting into their home. So, yeah, there's going to be a fight. Now, um... One of the most probably devastating things that we do is really encroach on their tribal territory. I mean, yeah, that's that's a major, major thing. But I think what has the most negative effect on the Native American people is what we do to the buffalo. This is kind of underrated because we're like, well, how does the buffalo matter? It matters because... Native Americans use the buffalo for everything. We're talking about clothing, we're talking about tools, we're talking, of course, the obvious, like, meat, right, to sustain themselves. I mean, they use, like, the hide for, like, clothing and, like, to build, like, their teepees. It, we're talking about using everything from the buffalo. The buffalo is worshipped and it is essential to their lives. So, when the railroad comes in, the buffalo is kind of a nuisance for them. Buffalo often get in the way of trains, cause derailments. Um, as you can see from this image right here, I mean, come on now. If I'm a buffalo, I think the train engine looks like a giant buffalo. <laughs> so I'm just following, you know, the alpha buffalo pretty much. And it's going to cause a problem. So you see these guys hanging off of the train, like shooting down the buffalo? That's their job. They're clearing the tracks of the buffalo so that... It doesn't interfere with the trains. And of course, Native Americans are like, oh my god, they're just wasting all these buffalo. It gets so bad that the buffalo is near extinction at the end of the 1800s. Okay, this next picture is kind of graphic. It's going to show to the extent that buffalo was hunted out west. So you guys see these pictures here, especially this one in the lower left-hand corner. That's nothing but buffalo skulls. On the upper left-hand corner, this rancher made an entire fence around their ranch out of buffalo skulls. We are talking hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of buffalo killed because of, you know, because of all of this. So... The Native American is really suffering because of the decimation of the buffalo. So government policy is going to be really harsh on them. Um, again, Native Americans to the government were seen as a nuisance. People in the way of them striking claim to Western lands. So um, policy towards Native Americans drastically changes. And... Um, of course, clashes with the cavalry out west is going to lead to massacres. One of the most famous massacres that we encounter is the Sand Creek Massacre. This happens in 1864, and this is against the Cheyenne. So the Cheyenne go to Fort Lyon to negotiate peace. They camp out at Sand Creek, and... They even fly an American flag <clears throat> and white surrender flag so that signals aren't crossed. So that, you know, the troops know that they want peace. So what happens is Colonel Shivington decides to order his troops to murder everyone. Men, women, children, the elderly. It is an outright massacre, and you see bodies lying in the snow. So, um, this atrocity just adds to the distrust that the Native American tribes have towards the American government. 
and this is going to kickstart the Plains Wars. So, uh, the Sioux are a tribe that definitely um, is going to go pretty much engaging in battle with the cavalry out west. And one of the most famous battles is actually a Sioux victory. This is the Battle of Little Bighorn. So we have Sitting Bull facing off against Custer. And uh, Colonel Custer is um, attacking the Sioux at Little Bighorn. And this is the famous like Custer's last stand. So um, the Sioux are victorious. Sitting Bull is victorious. But, of course, the American people are going to see this as like, oh, these savages just attacked our government and just attacked, like, our troops. Oh, my God. Like, yeah. <laughs> That's the kind of interpretation you'll read in newspapers out west. But this will be the last major victory for the Lakota Sioux and the Cheyenne who helped them. So, really, it's starting to become the beginning of the end for these... Um, Native American tribes. I mean, even Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce is going to be like, you know what? We're tired of, we're, we're tired of moving. We're tired of all of this. We just want peace. So, and we want to be free. So instead of moving to um, the reservations that were set up, Chief Joseph is going to make the arduous journey out to Canada with his people. But he doesn't make it there. They're going to eventually surrender um, and they're moved to Idaho. But, I mean, really, the lives of the Native Americans are turned upside down by westward expansion. So. What you do see in the movies are like Native American attacks and, I mean, tribes like the Apache, the Navajo, the Comanche are villainized in Western movies. But again, let's look at both sides. Yes, they were warfaring parties and they did attack settlements, but it was a two-way street. They got attacked themselves and people kept moving in on their lands. So really, you know, this is what happens when you get two clashing cultures together. So, um, what often happened out west were these ghost dances. Now, um, these ghost dances were performed by Native American cultures. Um, they're a spiritual movement. And, um, of course, you know, white people out west are going to be like, uh, that's a war dance. So, white settlers are like, what the hell's going on? Are they preparing for battle? What's going on? And thus tension is going to escalate out west because of this. So, the government will break its treaty with the Lakota in South Dakota. And what we have as a result is um, the Wounded Knee Massacre. So, the army sees the ghost dance happening, even though um, the Lakota were preparing to surrender. Shots are going to fire, and the army kills nearly 300 men, women, children, and the elderly once again. This would be the last major violent clash between the government and Native Americans, but really, you know, it's just been systematically that way during the entire, you know, conquering of the West. So, this makes a question. A look at this political cartoon here. Okay, we see Uncle Sam giving money, supplies, aids, and stuff to people of foreign nations. But when it comes to foreigners within our country, like the Native Americans, because they were a foreign nation, okay? We treat them with hostility and death. So, 
this is why I say like going out west and having interactions with Native Americans is pretty much imperialism when you think about it because we were the larger country, the more powerful force conquering smaller, weaker nations such as the Native American tribes. And much like imperialism, we encroached on their land, we took it, and we exploited it for the natural resources, just like we did during imperialism. So, what happens with Native Americans in this brutal affair is that the reservation system is put into place. Tribes are going to relocate to these areas. The land that they got was not the best. It wasn't suitable for farming. So we kind of gave them a bunch of bad land and expected them to become quote-unquote civilized in our eyes. So, to add insult to injury, what else we do to Native Americans is we try to assimilate them. Starting with their children. We take Native American children and we force them to go to boarding schools, much like the infamous Carlisle School in Pennsylvania. Can you imagine that? Being taken from your parents and your family to this far off place and being told that your culture and your tradition is wrong. Constantly being stripped of your identity. This is what we did. The reformers that did this think they were doing something good at the time. They thought that by showing the native savage the ways of Western civilization, that this would save their soul and save themselves in the long run. So these Native American children were taught manual labor skills, how to farm, how to read and write in English and do such things that people back east and in the rest of the country thought was civilized. So, what starts this off, the assimilation movement, is this book by Helen Hunt Jackson, where she publishes, um, you know, all the injustices done to the natives by the U.S. government and by the settlers. So, I don't know if this is a case of her heart was in the right place, but the execution was just really bad. Well, yeah, a century of dishonor will bring will shed light on all this stuff, and that's why reform-minded people in the 18, late 1880s and 1890s are going to push for the assimilation movement and these boarding schools for Native children. So, the Bureau of Indian Affairs is also established um, in 1824, but it will become more and more involved as we move further out west. And, um, you know, it's to help establish um, communication with the tribes and whatnot. But um, one other thing that's going to have a detrimental effect on Native Americans will be the Dawes Sovereignty Act. So this is part of the assimilation plan for Native Americans. And its goal was to basically strip them of tribal lands and... Um, force them into the white ways of farming. So these tribal lands will be divided up in 160 acre plots and you get to keep this land and stay on it for 25 years as long as you adopt the civilized ways of farming. Pretty much the white ways of farming, let's face it. So the government distributes only 47 million of these acres of land to Native Americans. 90 million, the best land, is going to be sold to white settlers, of course. So, a lot of Native Americans were forced to sell their land for much less than what it was worth. And um, pretty much the Dawes Act ushers in the end of the traditional way of life for Native Americans. So, that is... Um, our talk on Native American history out west. The last bit of information we have are settlers and cowboys. So, shifting gears again.
vaqueros are Spanish cowboys. All right, and in this instance, of course, Mexican cowboys. So I know we think about in movies and like in TV shows, oh yeah, the white cowboy. Uh-uh. <laughs> the white cowboy learned from the vaqueros. And there are also a lot of black cowboys as well. So cowboys in general are going to be a super diverse group. And that's why I was saying it depended on your industry um, and your merit to get respect and success out West. And so for various minorities like Mexicans and African Americans, by being a badass cowboy, that earned you respect and power out West. Well, more so respect and admiration and kind of equality too. So these vaqueros are going to teach you know, people the ways of the cowboy, pretty much. And um, Texas is going to become one of the biggest areas, or rather the biggest area, for cattle ranching. Because let's face it, people back east love some beef. <laughs> Come on now, steaks. T that's what we're talking about. So, um, Texas is going to lead the way with cattle ranching and... Um, cattle will travel through cattle trails. So the cattle industry is going to grow exponentially during the 1860s because of the Civil War. And again, it's going to continue throughout our second industrial revolution and into the Gilded Age. So ranches are going to exist all through the Southwest, but Texas is where it's at. And huge profits can be made by getting your cattle up to the rail yards and shift, like, shipped off to Chicago, where the meat packing plants were. So cowboys, like we said, were a very diverse group. It's going to include, well, a bunch of white dudes like we see in the movies. <laughs> African Americans, Mexicans, even some Native Americans are going to be some cowboys. So, like I said, guys, like, cowboys are really diverse. We even got immigrants coming in as cowboys. It's a really hard job, though. Like, no joke, I mean, cattle trails are dangerous and, you know, grueling. There is a big chance of death and possibility of, you know, losing some cattle and not getting paid and stuff. But um, the cowboy kind of represents like this rugged individualism, the American hero kind of image. And that's why, you know, they're part of the reason why we think the West is like so awesome. So... These cattle drives, guess what guys, they kind of started here in Brownsville. Again, we are freaking famous, <laughs> okay? Look at that, Brownsville. The beginnings of two big trails, which would be the Western Trail and the most famous trail of them all, the Chisholm Trail. So you see where they're going? They're going to the rail lines up north here, all right? You're either going to Abilene, Kansas, which is a big cow town all right um rail yards will also be established later on during this time period at fort worth um which you know the chisholm trail runs through so yeah let's see where, where's dodge city oh yeah dodge city's right there with the western trail like those are those are the biggest cattle towns we got kansas city again you know that's where the cowboys head off with all of those cows. And so cow towns will also mirror what the boom towns did with their lawlessness, with, you know, brothels, saloons, all of the above, but this time with cowboys <laughs> and not with miners. So, um, these places are also going to be your, your stereotypical Western towns. And in Dodge City is where we get badasses like Wyatt Earp. And his buddy, Doc Holiday. So, um, yeah. Again, the law being established, we still had vigilante justice. We still had like all this craziness that we talked about with the boom towns. But yeah, cattle towns with cow cowboys. Okay, um, boom towns with miners. 
So, um, we have Bat Masterson in this picture, along with Wyatt Earp, so they're, they're serving together. This is one badass group of, <laughs> of uh, sheriffs and such. So, we talked about the law out west. Let's talk about the lawlessness with the James Younger gang. So, Jesse James, one of the most infamous, you know, um, people out west, and he's going to do a bunch of train robberies. We're also going to see later on people like Billy the Kid, who initially gets involved in the range wars. Because you have cattle barons like Charles Goodnight, Richard King, and others who face off against settlers because Western settlers did not want a bunch of cows going through their land and eating their crops. So the range wars occur because of this. And um, though the cattle boom is not going to last forever, the decline of the cattle kingdom comes because of overexpansion. I mean, cows are everywhere at this point. Um, and because we have so many cows in the markets, pretty much, uh, beef prices are going to lower. Um, barbed wire is starting to be used by Western settlers, so this effectively closes off the range for cowboys and well, cattle drives and such. Bad weather is going to do the same, and then there are some diseases that strike the cattle. So going back to those range wars, um, Lincoln County is going to be the most famous one, and this is where we do get Billy the Kid. So, yeah. Billy the Kid, famous with these shootouts. And um, Johnson County is another big range war area. So, same thing. Cattle barons hire lawless gunmen to, you know, fight these wars for them against the settlers. So, um, back east, what we have as a view of the west is going to be stuff like Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show. And this is basically a caricature of, like, everything out west. Think of it as, like, a western circus. Like, that's kind of what we're talking about with this. We see Sitting Bull here. Um, <laughs> Annie Oakley doing some sharpshooting and trick shooting. Buffalo Bill looking stereotypical as hell. <laughs> like, the e people in the East are like eating this stuff up. They're like, this is freaking great. This is the West. And yeah. <laughs> sure, buddy. <laughs> Anyways, I mean, it. the West has already captured the imagination of the nation. So they take it as it comes. <laughs> but okay, let's go ahead and wrap this up with farming out west and the push for settlement out west because I know this video is really long already so let's let's wrap this up. Now in 1862 um, this is when the Department of Agriculture is established so of course there's going to be an emphasis on like farming and such. Now what really kickstarts people moving out west besides you know the transcontinental railroad later and well gold rushes and such is the Homestead Act. Because, okay, check this out. This is what the government did. They're like, hey, we want people to settle out west. Here's 160 acres. Free. Just farm it for five years. Dude, like, everybody's gonna want to do this. Everybody's gonna want to be like, hell yeah. <laughs> Free land? Sign me up. So, 500,000 families are gonna take advantage of this Homestead Act. But, <laughs> ah, they're, they're going to run into some stuff. There's going to be bad weather. There's going to be just, it's going to be harsh. <laughs> well, let's face it, bad weather, locusts, um, what else? We also got tornadoes because, hello, the Midwest has a bunch of tornadoes, droughts, <laughs> sometimes floods. I mean, it's not going to be easy. A lot of people end up abandoning their land. <laughs> But the ones that stick it out, you know, good stuff happens to them. They get rich. So, um, claims are kind of crazy because of the way the law is written. But um, 
yeah, people still take advantage of the Homestead Act and move out west to places like Nebraska and Kansas and, you know, other areas of the Midwest. So, um, yeah, it's not to say that the land wasn't taken up by speculators and cattlemen and miners and lumbermen and railroads. So, yeah, you're not left with, like, the best, best land either. But it was worth it to some people to move out there including African Americans. So these people are known as exodusters. They leave the South. They leave Reconstruction South because let's face it, violence, not a good place at that time for freedmen. So they're gonna move out to places like Kansas to you know, get away from all that stuff and to establish their own way of life. So we have, by 1881, over 25,000 African Americans had moved to this area. And yeah, that's where the exodusters, you know, established their new homes. Which really is kind of more of a win-win for them because, I mean, they got to escape the craziness of Reconstruction and those Redeemer governments that they faced. So, moving forward with the last part of this. Um, like we're saying, you know, once you made it to the plains, <laughs> uh, you had to live in sod houses, which if you guys don't know what sod is, it's basically like mud, like clay and mud kind of mixed together with grass. It's, it's really weird, but you could see these are like mud houses <laughs> and some of them were better than others. Okay. And there's hardly any lumber out in Kansas. I mean, hardly any freaking trees and stuff. You kind of import that stuff. So, yeah, sod houses are going to be the way to go. And they're dirty as hell. I mean, you've got a dirt floor and dirt, like, walls. Yeah. <laughs> Not going to be the nicest place to live in. You're going to run into a bunch of rodents and stuff. And, yeah, not a good place. Some sod houses are better than others, like... Dude, whoever this was that built a two-story sod house, whoa, <laughs> that is some amazing engineering and just freaking skill. Dude. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, my sod house would probably be the picture right next to it. Like, no joke, I'm so bad with this. <laughs> but anyways, um, like we are telling you guys before, weather's going to be harsh. Insects are going to destroy your crops, um, rain, you know, drought, <laughs> like just, just a bunch of bad, like biblical kind of stuff happening to you. So, um, people are going to, are going to leave it, leave after a while. Women in this area of the West, you know, they basically took a more domestic role, but they did contribute to the household. Um, and so... Although they may not experience as many rights right away in these areas, certainly, you know, Western states like Kansas will also grant women the right to vote well before the rest of the country does with the 19th Amendment. So, like I said, the West in general is a hella harsh place to live in, but for women, it's kind of worth it. So, um... There is going to be new farming research going on uh, with the Morrill Act, which establishes these land-grant colleges and universities. I know you guys see a few on here that ring a bell, which is like Texas A&M, you know, um, various state universities across the country. That's going to be their primary focus on agriculture, mining, that kind of stuff. So, um... Some of these new inventions, like Cyrus McCormick's Mechanical Reaper and others, are going to definitely help to bring agriculture out west because uh, the western soil is a lot harsher than back east. So you do need the steel plow and stuff um, from John Deere and other inventions to, to help your farm. So here's some of the other inventions we're talking about, like the reapers, the wire binders, mechanical cutters, and planters. Like 
you know, stuff to make your life a lot easier on the farm. But with these inventions, okay, yeah, agriculture is going to rise, so farm output rises. But this is kind of detrimental to the farmer because um, it's going to drop their crop prices as they produce more. This is kind of like a double-edged sword. So, yeah, farm products are um, steadily going to start declining because of deflation. Farmers aren't earning enough money um, with their crops and they're kind of just like sitting out there and just rotting. So they've already spent so much money on all of this new machinery and such because, well, let's face it, farmers farm. <laughs> okay, so this creates a massive debt for farmers. And by the time the late 1800s roll around, farmers are really suffering and they need help. So with this political cartoon right here, you see the poor farmer trying to ask the wealthy banker to help him keep his farm. And really this is going to end up becoming a big clash amongst farmers and the Western elites, well, Western railroads and Eastern bankers. Those are going to be the two biggest enemies of the farmer. So, yeah, this is kind of like where we're leaving off with the West. Like I said, guys, this time period of 1865 to 1900, there's so much going on in the country. We're going to have to regional base this. And so this area with the farmers out West, we're going to come back to it when we talk about Eastern wealthy industrialists with the Gilded Age, which is our next topic. So hope you guys stuck with me and enjoyed this because I know this was kind of long, but um, definitely we needed to understand these things to understand the other parts of this time period. So I will talk with you guys later. Bye.